Section 20 Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5 by Alexander Dumas This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5 by Alexander Dumas Section 20, La Constantin, Chapter 7 On the day following this extraordinary series of adventures, explanations between those who were mixed up in them, whether as actors or spectators, were the order of the day. It was not till Maître Kennebert reached the house of the friend who had offered to put him up for the night, that it first dawned on him that the interest which the Chevalier de Morange had awakened in his mind had made him utterly forget the bag containing the twelve hundred livres which he owed to the generosity of the widow. This money being necessary to him, he went back to her early next morning. He found her hardly recovered from her terrible fright. Her swoon had lasted far beyond the time when the notary had left the house, and as Angélique, not daring to enter the bewitched room, had taken refuge in the most distant corner of her apartments, the feeble call of the widow was heard by no one. Receiving no answer, Madame Rapailly groped her way into the next room, and, finding that empty, buried herself beneath the bedclothes, and passed the rest of the night dreaming of drawn swords, duels, and murders. As soon as it was light, she ventured into the mysterious room once more, without calling her servants, and found the bag of crowns lying open on the floor, with the coins scattered all around, the partition broken, and the tapestry hanging from it in shreds. The widow was near fainting again. She imagined at first she saw stains of blood everywhere, but a closer inspection having somewhat reassured her, she began to pick up the coins that had rolled to right and left, and was agreeably surprised to find the tale complete. But how and why had Maître Kennebert abandoned them? What had become of him? She had got lost in the most absurd suppositions and conjectures when the notary appeared. Discovering from the first word she uttered that she was in complete ignorance of all that had taken place, he explained to her that when the interview between the Chevalier and Mademoiselle de Guerchi had just at the most interesting moment been so unceremoniously interrupted by the arrival of the Duke, he had become so absorbed in watching them that he had not noticed that the partition was bending before the pressure of his body, and that just as the duke drew his sword, it suddenly gave way, and he, Kennebert, being thus left without support, tumbled head foremost into the next room, among a perfect chaos of overturned furniture and lamps that almost before he could rise he was forced to draw in self-defence, and had to make his escape defending himself against both the duke and the chevalier, that they had pursued him so hotly that when he found himself free he was too far from the house and the hour was too advanced to admit of his returning. Kennebert added innumerable protestations of friendship, devotion, and gratitude, and furnished with his twelve hundred crowns, went away, leaving the widow reassured as to his safety, but still shaken from her fright. While the notary was thus soothing the widow, Angélique was exhausting all the expedients her trade had taught her in the attempt to remove the duke's suspicions. She asserted she was the victim of an unforeseen attack which nothing in her conduct had ever authorised. The young Chevalier de Marange had gained admittance, she declared, under the pretext that he brought her news from the Duke, the one man who occupied her thoughts 
the sole object of her love. The chevalier had seen her lover, he said, a few days before, and by cleverly appealing to things back, he had led her to fear that the duke had grown tired of her, and that a new conquest was the cause of his absence. She had not believed these insinuations, although his long silence would have justified the most mortifying suppositions, the most cruel doubts. At length the chevalier had grown bolder, and had declared his passion for her, whereupon she had risen and ordered him to leave her. Just at that moment the duke had entered, and had taken the natural agitation and confusion of the chevalier as signs of her guilt. Some explanation was also necessary to account for the presence of the two other visitors of whom he had been told below stairs. As he knew nothing at all about them, the servant who admitted them never having seen either of them before, she acknowledged that two gentlemen had called earlier in the evening, that they had refused to send in their names, but, as they had said they had come to inquire about the duke, she suspected them of having been in league with the chevalier in the attempt to ruin her reputation. Perhaps they had even promised to help him to carry her off, but she knew nothing positive about them or their plans. The duke, contrary to his wont, did not allow himself to be easily convinced by these lame explanations, but unfortunately for him the lady knew how to assume an attitude favourable to her purpose. She had been induced, she said, with the simple confidence born of love, to listen to people who had led her to suppose they could give her news of one so dear to her as the duke. From this falsehood she proceeded to bitter reproaches. Instead of defending herself, she accused him of having left her a prey to anxiety. She went so far as to imply that there must be some foundation for the hints of the chevalier, until at last the duke, although he was not guilty of the slightest infidelity, and had excellent reasons to give in justification of his silence, was soon reduced to a penitent mood, and changed his threats into entreaties for forgiveness. As to the shriek he had heard, and which he was sure had been uttered by the stranger who had forced his way into her room after the departure of the others, she asserted that his ears must have deceived him. Feeling that therein lay her best chance of making things smooth, she exerted herself to convince him that there was no need for other information than she could give, and did all she could to blot the whole affair from his memory. And her success was such, that at the end of the interview the duke was more enamoured and more credulous than ever, and believing he had done her wrong, he delivered himself up to her, bound hand and foot. Two days later he installed his mistress in another dwelling. Madame Rapailly also resolved to give up her rooms, and removed to a house that belonged to her on the Pont Saint-Michel. The commander took the condition of Charlotte Boulenois very much to heart. The physician, under whose care he had placed her, after examining her wounds, had not given much hope of her recovery. It was not that de Jar was capable of a lasting love, but Charlotte was young and possessed great beauty, and the romance and mystery surrounding their connection gave it piquancy. Charlotte's disguise, too, which enabled de Jar to conceal his success and yet flaunt it in the face, as it were, of public morality and curiosity, charmed him by its audacity, and above all, he was carried away by the bold and uncommon character of the girl, who, not content with a prosaic intrigue, had trampled underfoot all social prejudices and proprieties, and plunged at once into unmeasured and unrestrained dissipation. The singular mingling in her nature of the vices of both sexes, 
the unbridled licentiousness of the courtesan coupled with the devotion of a man for horses, wine, and fencing. In short, her eccentric character, as it would now be called, kept a passion alive which would else have quickly died away in his blasé heart. Nothing would induce him to follow Genin's advice to leave Paris for at least a few weeks, although he shared Genin's fear that the statement they had been forced to give the stranger would bring them into trouble. The treasurer, who had no love affair on hand, went off. But the commander bravely held his ground, and at the end of five or six days, during which no one disturbed him, began to think the only result of the incident would be the anxiety it had caused him. Every evening, as soon as it was dark, he betook himself to the doctor's, wrapped in his own cloak, armed to the teeth, and his hat pulled down over his eyes. For two days and nights Charlotte, whom to avoid confusion we shall continue to call the Chevalier de Morange, hovered between life and death. Her youth and the strength of her constitution enabled her at last to overcome the fever, in spite of the want of skill of the surgeon Perregaud. Although de Jarre was the only person who visited the Chevalier, he was not the only one who was anxious about the patient's health. Maître Quennebert, or men engaged by him to watch, for he did not want to attract attention, were always prowling about the neighbourhood, so that he was kept well informed of everything that went on. The instructions he gave to these agents were that if a funeral should leave the house, they were to find out the name of the deceased, and then to let him know without delay. But all these precautions seemed quite useless. He always received the same answer to all his questions. We know nothing. So at last he determined to address himself directly to the man who could give him information on which he could rely. One night the commander left the surgeons feeling more cheerful than usual, for the chevalier had passed a good day, and there was every hope that he was on the road to complete recovery. Hardly had de Jarre gone twenty paces when someone laid a hand on his shoulder. He turned and saw a man whom, in the darkness, he did not recognise. "'Excuse me for detaining you, Commander de Jarre, said Quennebert, "'but I have a word to say to you.' "'Ali, so it's you, sir,' replied the commander. "'Are you going at last to give me the opportunity I was so anxious for? "'I don't understand. "'We are on more equal terms this time. "'Today you don't catch me unprepared, almost without weapons, "'and if you are a man of honour. "'You will measure swords with me. "'Fight a duel with you? Why, may I ask? "'You have never insulted me. "'A truce to pleasantry, sir. "'Don't make me regret that I have shown myself more generous than you. "'I might have killed you just now, had I wished. "'I could have put my pistol to your breast and fired, "'or, or said to you, "'Surrender at discretion, as you so lately said to me.' "'And what use would that have been? "'It would have made a secret safe that you ought never to have known. "'It would have been the most unfortunate thing for you that could have happened, "'for if you had killed me, the paper would have spoken. "'So you think that if you were to assassinate me, "'you would only have to stoop over my dead body and search my pockets, "'and having found the incriminating document, destroy it? "'You seem to have formed no very high opinion of my intelligence and common sense. "'You of the upper classes don't need these qualities. "'The law is on your side. "'But when a humble individual like myself, a mere nobody, "'undertakes to investigate a piece of business "'about which those in authority are not anxious to be enlightened, "'precautions are necessary.' It's not enough for him to have right on his side. 
he must, in order to secure his own safety, make good use of his skill, courage, and knowledge. I have no desire to humiliate you a second time, so I will say no more. The paper is in the hands of my notary, and if a single day passes without his seeing me, he has orders to break the seal and make the contents public. So, you see, chance is still on my side. But now that you are warned, there is no need for me to bluster. I am quite prepared to acknowledge your superior rank, and if you insist upon it, to speak to you uncovered. What do you desire to know, sir? How is the Chevalier de Morange getting on? Very badly, very badly. Take care, commander, don't deceive me. One is so easily tempted to believe what one hopes, and I hope so strongly that I dare not believe what you say. I saw you coming out of the house, not at all with the air of a man who had just heard bad news. Quite the contrary. You looked at the sky and rubbed your hands and walked with a light, quick step that did not speak of grief. You're a sharp observer, sir. I have already explained to you, sir, that when one of us belonging to a class hardly better than serfs succeeds by chance or force of character in getting out of the narrow bounds in which he was born, he must keep both eyes and ears open. If I had doubted your word as you have doubted mine on the merest suspicion, you would have said to your servants, "'Chastise this rascal!' but I am obliged to prove to you that you did not tell me the truth. Now I am sure that the Chevalier is out of danger. If you were so well informed, why did you ask me? I only knew it by your asserting the contrary. What do you mean? cried de Jean, who was growing restive under this cold satirical politeness. Do me justice, commander. The bit chafes, but yet you must acknowledge that I have a light hand. For a full week you have been in my power. Have I disturbed your quiet? Have I betrayed your secret? You know I have not. And I shall continue to act in the same manner. I hope with all my heart, however great would be your grief, that the Chevalier may die of his wound. I have not the same reasons for loving him that you have. So much you can readily understand, even if I do not explain the cause of my interest in his fate. But in such a matter, hopes count for nothing. They cannot make his temperature either rise or fall. I have told you that I have no wish to force the Chevalier to resume his real name. I may make use of the document, and I may not but if I am obliged to use it, I shall give you warning. Will you in return swear to me upon your honour that you will keep me informed as to the fate of the Chevalier, whether you remain in Paris or whether you leave? But let this agreement be a secret between us, and do not mention it to the so-called Morange. I have your oath, monsieur, that you will Give me notice before you use the document I have given you against me, have I? But what guarantee have I that you will keep your word? My course of action till today, and the fact that I have pledged you word of my own free will. I see. You hope not to have long to wait for the end. I hope not but meantime a premature disclosure would do me as much harm as you. I have not the slightest rancour against you, Commander. You have robbed me of no treasure. I have therefore no compensation to demand. What you place such value on would only be a burden to me, as it will be to you later on. All I want is to know as soon as it is no longer in your possession— whether it has been removed by the will of God or by your own, I am right 
in thinking that to-day there is some hope of the Chevalier's recovery, am I not? Yes, sir. Do you give me your promise that if ever he leave this house safe and sound, you will let me know? I give you my promise. And if the result should be different, you will also send me word? Certainly. But to whom shall I address my message? I should have thought that since our first meeting you would have found out all about me, and that to tell you my name would be superfluous. But I have no reason to hide it. Maître Kennebert, notary, Saint-Denis. I will not detain you any longer now, Commander. Excuse a simple citizen for dictating conditions to a noble such as you. For once, chance has been on my side, although a score of times it has gone against me. De Jarre made no reply except a nod, and walked away quickly, muttering words of suppressed anger between his teeth at all the humiliations to which he had been obliged to submit so meekly. "'He's as insolent as a varlet who has no fear of a larruping before his eyes. How the rapscallion gloried in taking advantage of his position!' taking off his hat while putting his foot on my neck. If ever I can be even with you, my worthy scrivener, you'll pass a very bad quarter of an hour, I can tell you. Everyone has his own idea of what constitutes perfect honour. De Jarre, for instance, would have allowed himself to be cut up into little pieces rather than have broken the promise he had given Quennebert a week ago because it was given in exchange for his life, and the slightest paltering with his word under those circumstances would have been dastardly. But the engagement into which he had just entered had in his eyes no such moral sanction. He had not been forced into it by threats, he had escaped by its means no serious danger, and therefore in regard to it his conscience was much more accommodating. What he should best have liked to do would have been to have sought out the notary and provoked him by insults to send him a challenge. That a clown such as that could have any chance of leaving the ground alive never entered his head, but willingly as he would have encompassed his death in this manner, the knowledge that his secret would not die with Quennebert restrained him for when everything came out he felt that the notary's death would be regarded as an aggravation of his original offence, and in spite of his rank he was not at all certain that if he were put on his trial even now he would escape scot-free, much less if a new offence were added to the indictment. So however much he might chafe against the bit, he felt he must submit to the bridle. "'By God!' said he, "'I know what the clodhopper is after, and even if I must suffer in consequence, I shall take good care that he cannot shake off his bonds. Wait a bit! I can play the detective too, and be down on him without letting him see the hand that deals the blows. It'll be a wonder if I can't find a naked sword to suspend above his head.' However, while thus brooding over projects of vengeance, Commander de Jarre kept his word, and about a month after the interview above related, he sent word to Quennebert that the Chevalier de Morange had left Pergoz completely recovered from his wound. But the nearly fatal result of the Chevalier's last prank seemed to have subdued his adventurous spirit. He was no longer seen in public, and was soon forgotten by all his acquaintances, with the exception of Mademoiselle de Guerchi. She faithfully treasured up the memory of his words of passion, his looks of love, the warmth of his caresses, although at first she struggled hard to chase his image from her heart. But as the Duc de Vitry assured her that he had killed him on the spot, she considered it no breach of faith 
to think lovingly of the dead, and while she took the goods so bounteously provided by her living lover, her gentlest thoughts, her most enduring regrets, were given to one whom she never hoped to see again. End of section 20《Section 21 Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, by Alexandre Dumas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, by Alexandre Dumas. Section 21. La Constantin. Chapter 8. With the reader's permission, we must now jump over an interval of rather more than a year, and bring upon the stage a person who, though only of secondary importance, can no longer be left behind the scenes. We have already said that the loves of Quennebert and Madame Rapailly were regarded with a jealous eye by a distant cousin of the lady's late husband. The love of this rejected suitor, whose name was Trumeau, was no more sincere than the notary's, nor were his motives more honourable. Although his personal appearance was not such as to lead him to expect that his path would be strewn with conquests, he considered that his charms at least equalled those of his defunct relative, and it may be said that in thus estimating them he did not lay himself open to the charge of overweening vanity. But, however persistently he preened himself before the widow, she vouchsafed him not one glance. Her heart was filled with the love of his rival, and it is no easy thing to tear a rooted passion out of a widow's heart when that widow's age is forty-six, and she is silly enough to believe that the admiration she feels is equalled by the admiration she inspires, as the unfortunate Trumeau found to his cost. All his carefully prepared declarations of love all his skilful insinuations against Quennebert brought him nothing but scornful rebuffs. But Trumeau was nothing if not persevering, and he could not habituate himself to the idea of seeing the widow's fortune pass into other hands than his own, so that every baffled move only increased his determination to spoil his competitor's game. He was always on the watch for a chance to carry tales to the widow, and so absorbed did he become in this fruitless pursuit, that he grew yellower and more dried up from day to day, and to his jaundiced eye the man who was at first simply his rival became his mortal enemy, and the object of his implacable hate, so that at length, merely to get the better of him, to outwit him would, after so long continued and obstinate a struggle, and so many defeats, have seemed to him too mild a vengeance, too incomplete a victory. Quennebert was well aware of the zeal with which the indefatigable Trumeau sought to injure him, but he regarded the manoeuvres of his rival with supreme unconcern for he knew that he could at any time sweep away the network of cunning machinations, underhand insinuations and malicious hints which was spread around him, by allowing the widow to confer on him the advantages she was so anxious to bestow. The goal he knew was within his reach, but the problem he had to solve was how to linger on the way thither, how to defer the triumphal moment how to keep hope alive in the fair one's breast, and yet delay its fruition. His affairs were in a bad way. Day by day full possession of the fortune thus dangled before his eyes, and fragments of which came to him occasionally by way of loan, was becoming more and more indispensable, 
and tantalising though it was, yet he dared not put out his hand to seize it. His creditors dunned him relentlessly. One final reprieve had been granted him, but that at an end, if he could not meet their demands, it was all up with his career and reputation. One morning in the beginning of February, 1660, Trumeau called to see his cousin. He had not been there for nearly a month, and Quennebert and the widow had begun to think that, hopeless of success, he had retired from the contest. But far from that, his hatred had grown more intense than ever, and having come upon the traces of an event in the past life of his rival, which, if proved, would be the ruin of that rival's hopes, he set himself to gather evidence. He now made his appearance with beaming looks, which expressed a joy too great for words. He held in one hand a small scroll tied with a ribbon. He found the widow alone, sitting in a large easy chair before the fire. She was reading for the twentieth time a letter which Kennebert had written her the evening before. To judge by the happy and contented expression of the widow's face, it must have been couched in glowing terms. Trumeau guessed at once from whom the missive came, but the sight of it, instead of irritating him, called forth a smile. "'Ah, so it's you, cousin,' said the widow, folding the precious paper and slipping it into the bosom of her dress. "'How do you do? It's a long time since I saw you, more than a fortnight, I think. Have you been ill?' "'So you remarked my absence. That is very flattering, my dear cousin. You do not often spoil me by such attentions.' "'No, I have not been ill, thank God, but I thought it better not to intrude upon you so often.' A friendly call now and then, such as today's, is what you like, is it not? By the way, tell me about your handsome suitor, Maître Kennebert. How is he getting along? You look very knowing, Trumeau. Have you heard of anything happening to him? No, and I should be exceedingly sorry to hear that anything unpleasant had happened to him. Now you are not saying what you think. You know you can't bear him. Well, to speak the truth, I have no great reason to like him. If it were not for him, I should perhaps have been happy today. My love might have moved your heart. However, I have become resigned to my loss, and since your choice has fallen on him— And here he sighed. Well, all I can say is, I hope you may never regret it. Many thanks for your good will, cousin. I am delighted to find you in such a benevolent mood. You must not be vexed because I could not give you the kind of love you wanted. The heart, you know, is not amenable to reason. There is only one thing I should like to ask. What is it? I mention it for your good more than for my own. If you want to be happy— don't let this handsome quill-driver get you entirely into his hands. You are saying to yourself that because of my ill-success with you I am trying to injure him, but what if I could prove that he does not love you as much as he pretends? Come, come, control your naughty tongue. Are you going to begin backbiting again? You are playing a mean part, Trumeau. I have never hinted to Maître Kennebert all the nasty little ways in which you have tried to put a spoke in his wheel, for if he knew he would ask you to prove your words, and then you would look very foolish. Not at all, I swear to you. On the contrary, if I were to tell all I know in his presence, it is not I who would be disconcerted. Oh, I am weary of meeting with nothing from you but snubs, scorn, and abuse. You think me a slanderer when I say this gallant wooer of widows does not love you for yourself, but for your money-bags. He fools you by fine promises, but as to marrying you, never, never! 
"'May I ask you to repeat that?' broke in Madame Rapailly. "'Oh, I know what I'm saying. "'You will never be Madame Kennebert. "'Really? Really? "'Jealousy has eaten away whatever brains you used to possess, Trumeau. "'Since I saw you last, cousin, important changes have taken place. "'I was just going to send you today an invitation to my wedding.' "'To your wedding?' "'Yes, I am to be married to-morrow.' "'To-morrow? To Cunnebert?' To stammered Trumeau. "'To Cunnebert,' repeated the widow in a tone of triumph. "'It's not possible!' exclaimed Trumeau. "'It is so possible that you will see us united to-morrow. "'And for the future I must beg of you to regard Cunnebert no longer as a rival but as my husband, whom to offend will be to offend me. The tone in which these words were spoken no longer left room for doubt as to the truth of the news. Trumeau looked down for a few moments, as if reflecting deeply before definitely making up his mind. He twisted the little roll of papers between his fingers, and seemed to be in doubt whether to open it and give it to Madame Rapailly to read or not. In the end, however, he put it in his pocket, rose, and approaching his cousin, said, "'I beg your pardon. This news completely changes my opinion. From the moment Maître Quennebert becomes your husband, I shall not have a word to say against him. My suspicions were unjust, I confess it frankly, and I hope that in consideration of the motives which prompted me, you will forget the warmth of my attacks. I shall make no protestations, but shall let the future show how sincere is my devotion to your interests. Madame Rapailly was too happy, too certain of being loved, not to pardon easily. With the self-complacency and factitious generosity of a woman who feels herself the object of two violent passions, she was so good as to feel pity for the lover who was left out in the cold, and offered him her hand. Trumeau kissed it with every outward mark of respect, while his lips curled unseen in a smite of mockery. The cousins parted, apparently the best of friends, and on the understanding that Trumeau would be present at the nuptial benediction, which was to be given in a church beyond the town hall, near the house in which the newly married couple were to live, the house on the Pont Saint-Michel having been lately sold to great advantage. "'On my word,' said Trumeau, as he went off, "'it would have been a great mistake to have spoken. I have got that wretch of a Kennebert into my clutches at last, and there is nobody but himself to blame. He is taking the plunge of his own free will. There is no need for me to shove him off the precipice. The ceremony took place next day. Kennebert conducted his interesting bride to the altar. She hung with ornaments like the shrine of a saint, and beaming all over with smiles, looked so ridiculous that the handsome bridegroom reddened to the roots of his hair with shame. Just as they entered the church, a coffin, on which lay a sword, and which was followed by a single mourner, who from his manners and dress seemed to belong to the class of nobles, was carried in by the same door. The wedding guests drew back to let the funeral pass on, the living giving precedence to the dead. The solitary mourner glanced by chance at Cunibert, and started as if the sight of him was painful. "'What an unlucky meeting!' murmured Madame Rapailly. "'It is sure to be a bad omen.' "'It's sure to be the exact opposite,' said Cunibert, smiling. The two ceremonies took place simultaneously in two adjoining chapels, the funeral dirges which fell on the widow's ear, full of sinister prediction, seemed to have quite another meaning for Quennebert, for his features lost their look of care, his wrinkles smoothed themselves out, till the guests, among whom was Trumeau, 
who did not suspect the secret of his relief from suspense, began to believe, despite their surprise, that he was really rejoiced at obtaining legal possession of the charming Madame Rapailly. As for her, she fleeted the daylight hours by anticipating the joyful moment when she would have her husband all to herself. When night came, hardly had she entered the nuptial chamber than she heard a piercing shriek. She had just found and read a paper left on the bed by Trumeau, who before leaving had contrived to glide into the room unseen. Its contents were of terrible import, so terrible that the new-made wife fell unconscious to the ground. Quennebert, who without a smile was absorbed in reflections on the happiness at last within his grasp, heard the noise from the next room, and rushing in, picked up his wife. Catching sight of the paper, he also uttered a cry of anger and astonishment, but in whatever circumstances he found himself he was never long uncertain how to act. Placing Madame Quennebert still unconscious on the bed, he called her maid, and having impressed on her that she was to take every care of her mistress, and above all to tell her from him as soon as she came to herself that there was no cause for alarm, he left the house at once. An hour later, in spite of the efforts of the servants, he forced his way into the presence of Commander de Jarre. Holding out the fateful document to him, he said, "'Speak openly, Commander. Is it you who in revenge for your long constraint have done this? I can hardly think so, for after what has happened you know that I have nothing to fear any longer. Still, knowing my secret and unable to do it in any other way, have you perchance taken your revenge by an attempt to destroy my future happiness by sowing dissension and disunion between me and my wife?' The commander solemnly assured him that he had had no hand in bringing about the discovery. "'Then if it's not you, it must be a worthless being called Trumeau, who with the unerring instinct of jealousy has run the truth to earth. But he only knows half. I have never been either so much in love or so stupid as to allow myself to be trapped. I have given you my promise to be discreet, and not to misuse my power, and as long as was compatible with my own safety, I have kept my word. But now you must see that I am bound to defend myself, and to do that I shall be obliged to summon you as a witness. So leave Paris to-night and seek out some safe retreat where no one can find you, for to-morrow I shall speak. Of course, if I am quit for a woman's tears, if no more difficult task lies before me than to soothe a weeping wife, you can return immediately. But if, as is too probable, the blow has been struck by the hand of a rival, furious at having been defeated, the matter will not so easily be cut short, and then I must get my head out of the noose which some fingers I know of are itching to draw tight." "'You are quite right, sir,' answered the commander. "'I fear that my influence at court is not strong enough to enable me to brave the matter out. "'Well, my success has cost me dear, but it has cured me forever of seeking out similar adventures. "'My preparations will not take long, and to-morrow's dawn will find me far from Paris.' Quennebert bowed and withdrew, returning home to console his Ariadne. End of section 21。section 22, Celebrated Crimes, volume 5, by Alexander Dumas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, 
by Alexander Dumas. Section 22. La Constantin. Chapter 9. The accusation hanging over the head of Maître Quennebert was a very serious one, threatening his life if proved. But he was not uneasy. He knew himself in possession of facts which would enable him to refute it triumphantly. The platonic love of Angélique de Guerchy for the handsome Chevalier de Morange had resulted, as we have seen, in no practical wrong to the Duc de Vitry. After her reconciliation with her lover, brought about by the eminently satisfactory explanations she was able to give of her conduct, which we have already laid before our readers, she did not consider it advisable to shut her heart to his pleadings much longer, and the consequence was that at the end of a year she found herself in a condition which it was necessary to conceal from every one. To Angélique herself, it is true, the position was not new, and she felt neither grief nor shame regarding the coming event as a means of making her future more secure by forging a new link in the chain which bound the duke to her. But he, sure that but for himself Angélique would never have strayed from virtue's path, could not endure the thought of her losing her reputation and becoming an object for scandal to point her finger at. So that Angélique, who could not well seem less careful of her good name than he, was obliged to turn his song of woe into a duet, and consent to certain measures being taken. One evening, therefore, shortly before Maître Quennebert's marriage, the fair lady set out, ostensibly on a journey which was to last a fortnight or three weeks. In reality, she only made a circle in a post-chaise round Paris, which she re-entered at one of the barriers, where the duke awaited her with a sedan chair. In this she was carried to the very house to which de Jarre had brought his pretended nephew after the duel. Angélique, who had to pay dearly for her errors, remained there only twenty-four hours, and then left in her coffin, which was hidden in a cellar under the palace of the Prince de Conde, the body being covered with quicklime. Two days after this dreadful death, Commander de Jarre presented himself at the fatal house, and engaged a room in which he installed the chevalier. This house, which we are about to ask the reader to enter with us, stood at the corner of the Rue de la Tixeranderie and the Rue de Porte. There was nothing in the exterior of it to distinguish it from any other, unless perhaps two brass plates, one of which bore the words Marie le Roux Constantin, widow, certified midwife, and the other Claude Perregaud, surgeon. These plates were affixed to the blank wall in the Rue de la Tixeranderie, the windows of the rooms on that side looking into the courtyard. The house door, which opened directly on the first steps of a narrow winding stair, was on the other side, just beyond the low arcade under whose vaulted roof access was gained to that end of the Rue des Deux Portes. This house, though dirty, mean, and out of repair, received many wealthy visitors, whose brilliant equipage waited for them in the neighbouring streets. Often in the night, great ladies crossed its threshold under assumed names, and remained there for several days, during which La Constantin and Claude Perregaud, by an infamous use of their professional knowledge, restored their clients to an outward appearance of honour, and enabled them to maintain their reputation for virtue. The first and second floors contained a dozen rooms in which these abominable mysteries were practised. 
The large apartment which served as waiting and consultation room was oddly furnished, being crowded with objects of strange and unfamiliar form. It resembled at once the operating room of a surgeon, the laboratory of a chemist and alchemist, and the den of a sorcerer. There, mixed up together in the greatest confusion, lay instruments of all sorts, cauldrons and retorts, as well as books containing the most absurd ravings of the human mind. There were the twenty folio volumes of Albertus Magnus, the works of his disciple Thomas de Cantopre, of Alkindus, of Averroes, of Avicenna, of Alcabitius, of David de Plencampi, called Ledelf, surgeon to Louis XIII, and author of the celebrated book The Morbific Hydra Exterminated by the Chemical Hercules. Beside a bronze head, such as the monk Roger Bacon possessed, which answered all the questions that were addressed to it, and foretold the future by means of a magic mirror and the combination of the rules of perspective, lay an egg-shell, the same which had been used by Carré, as Daubigne tells us, when making men out of germs, mandrakes, and crimson silk over a slow fire. In the presses, which had sliding doors fastening with secret springs, stood jars filled with noxious drugs, the power of which was but too efficacious. In prominent positions, facing each other, hung two portraits, one representing Hierophilus, a Greek physician, and the other Agnodice, his pupil, the first Athenian midwife. For several years already, La Constantin and Claude Pergot had carried on their criminal practices without interference. A number of persons were, of course, in the secret, but their interests kept them silent, and the two accomplices had at last persuaded themselves that they were perfectly safe. One evening, however, Pergot came home, his face distorted by terror and trembling in every limb. He had been warned while out that the suspicions of the authorities had been aroused in regard to him and La Constantin. It seemed that some little time ago the vicar's general had sent a deputation to the president of the chief court of justice, having heard from their priests that in one year alone six hundred women had avowed in the confessional that they had taken drugs to prevent their having children. This had been sufficient to arouse the vigilance of the police, who had set a watch on Perrigaud's house, with the result that that very night a raid was to be made on it. The two criminals took hasty counsel together, but, as usual under such circumstances, arrived at no practical conclusions. It was only when the danger was upon them that they recovered their presence of mind. In the dead of night, loud knocking at the street door was heard, followed by the command to open in the name of the king. "'We can yet save ourselves!' exclaimed the surgeon, with a sudden flash of inspiration. Rushing into the room where the pretended chevalier was lying, he called out, "'The police are coming up! If they discover your sex, you are lost, and so am I! Do as I tell you!' At a sign from him, La Constantin went down and opened the door. While the rooms on the first floor were being searched, Pergot made with a lancet a superficial incision in the chevalier's right arm, which gave very little pain and bore a close resemblance to a sword cut. Surgery and medicine were at that time so inextricably involved, required such apparatus, and bristled with such scientific absurdities, that no astonishment was excited by the extraordinary collection of instruments which loaded the tables and covered the floors below. Even the titles of certain treatises which there had been no time to destroy awoke no suspicion. 
Fortunately for the surgeon and his accomplice, they had only one patient, the chevalier, in their house when the descent was made. When the chevalier's room was reached, the first thing which the officers of the law remarked were the hat, spurred boots, and sword of the patient. Claude Perregaud hardly looked up as the room was invaded. He only made a sign to those who came in to be quiet, and went on dressing the wound. Completely taken in, the officer in command merely asked the name of the patient and the cause of the wound. La Constantin replied that it was the young Chevalier de Morange, nephew of Commander de Jarre, who had had an affair of honour that same night, and being slightly wounded had been brought thither by his uncle hardly an hour before. These questions, and the apparently trustworthy replies elicited by them, being duly taken down, the uninvited visitors retired, having discovered nothing to justify their visit. All might have been well, had there been nothing the matter but the wound on the chevalier's sword-arm. But at the moment when Perregaud gave it to him, the poisonous nostrums employed by La Constantin were already working in his blood. Violent fever ensued, and in three days the chevalier was dead. It was his funeral which had met Kennebert's wedding party at the church door. Everything turned out as Kennebert had anticipated. Madame Kennebert, furious at the deceit which had been practised on her, refused to listen to her husband's justification, and Trumeau, not letting the grass grow under his feet, hastened the next day to launch an accusation of bigamy against the notary. For the paper which had been found in the nuptial chamber was nothing less than an attested copy of a contract of marriage concluded between Kennebert and Josephine Charlotte Boulenois. It was by the merest chance that Trumeau had come on the record of the marriage, and he now challenged his rival to produce a certificate of the death of his first wife. Charlotte Boulenois, after two years of marriage, had demanded a deed of separation, which demand Kennebert had opposed. While the case was going on, she had retired to the convent of La Raquette, where her intrigue with de Jarre began. The commander easily induced her to let herself be carried off by force. He then concealed his conquest by causing her to adopt male attire, a mode of dress which accorded marvellously well with her peculiar tastes and rather masculine frame. At first, Kennebert had instituted an active but fruitless search for his missing wife, but soon became habituated to his state of enforced single blessedness, enjoying to the full the liberty it brought with it. But his business had thereby suffered, and once having made the acquaintance of Madame Rapailly, he cultivated it assiduously, knowing her fortune would be sufficient to set him straight again with the world, though he was obliged to exercise the utmost caution and reserve in his intercourse with her, as she on her side displayed none of these qualities. At last, however, matters came to such a pass that he must either go to prison or run the risk of a second marriage so he reluctantly named a day for the ceremony, resolving to leave Paris with Madame Rapailly as soon as he had settled with his creditors. In the short interval which ensued, and while Trumeau was hugging the knowledge of the discovery he had made, a stroke of luck had brought the pretended chevalier to La Constantin. As Kennebert had kept an eye on Dejar, and was acquainted with all his movements, he was aware of everything that happened at Perregaud's, and as Charlotte's death preceded his second marriage by one day, he knew 
that no serious consequences would ensue from the legal proceedings taken against him. He produced the declarations made by Mademoiselle de Guetchi and the commander, and had the body exhumed. Extraordinary and improbable as his defence appeared at first to be, the exhumation proved the truth of his assertions. These revelations, however, drew the eye of justice again on Perregaud and his partner in crime, and this time their guilt was brought home to them. They were condemned by parliamentary decree to be hanged by the neck till they were dead, on a gallows erected for that purpose at the crossroads of the Croix du Trois-Rois, their bodies to remain there for twenty-four hours, then to be cut down and brought back to Paris, where they were to be exposed on a gibbet, etc., etc. It was proved that they had amassed immense fortunes in the exercise of their infamous calling. The entries in the books seized at their house, though sparse, would have led, if made public, to scandals involving many in high places. It was therefore judged best to limit the accusation to the two deaths by blood poisoning of Angélique de Guerchy and Charlotte Boulenois. End of section 21 End of La Constantin End of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5